Steve, I am so, so happy to have you with us today. Everybody, we've got Steve Stepanovich with us. So he's a, a few years older than me. And man, when I was growing up, I just love watching Mizzou basketball. And if I could at that time talk to anybody in the world, it would have been Steve or this guy named John. John was a little guy, so I'm more related to him being a point guard growing up. But I thought, man, if I could ever have that height and strength and everything that Steve's got, man, that'd be awesome. So Steve, obviously you've had a phenomenal basketball career, but you've done quite a bit since then as well. Uh, you know, family, kids, guys turn to you for advice all the time and everything else. But uh, anyway, I kind of shortcut your introduction and just say thank you so much for, for coming on with us and, uh, you know, welcome. Yeah, well, thank you for having me. I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to chat with you this morning and, uh, you know, ask away any questions. Uh, you make me feel old with that introduction, although I just turned 60 a couple of days ago. So I am, I guess I am up there. So anyway, uh, ask away. That's, that's... I'm, I'm 48. So I'm like, we're, we're kind of there, you know, <laughs> you know, we're not that, that, that distant from each other. So I, what was your childhood like? Like, you know, I, I got to know you from TV watching you play at Mizzou. But prior to that, what, what was your childhood like? Just curious. You know, it was pretty average. I think that uh, I uh, grew up in St. Louis and uh, we, my brothers, there's two brothers and a sister. There's four of us all together. And we were just very into sports. My dad played college basketball at St. Louis University. And, and uh, we just gravitated toward playing sports a lot. Hockey, uh, when we were young uh, in St. Louis, was always was real popular back then. But we just went to the park after school and played various sports and it was before all the internet and, and yeah. uh, all the stuff now. So we just always left the house and uh, there's this park up where we live, Vanita park. Uh, and we used to go up there every day after school and play soccer, football. And, and so we just all played, we just played sports. We love sports. And uh, my brother, Ted and I ended up being actually pretty good uh, high school players and, and heavily recruited. My brother, Ted was a football player at Chaminade oh, wow. in high school. And then I was a, uh, a basketball player at DeSmet. Um, and uh, my younger brother, Mike actually played at DeSmet too. They won a state championship there oh. with coach, with coach Grower as well. So oh, yeah. uh, we, we just, we just kind of a sports family. Yeah. This man, man, you guys have had some people come through that high school. So I, I grew up playing basketball with a guy named Jeff Gayona, who was widely recruited yeah. and things and name it up in the rafters at the Smet and things like that. And then John O'Leary was there. Uh, John's mm -hmm. a little famous with a couple books out there in yeah. Oz, his latest one that's out there. And uh, Larry Hagner with the dad, the dad's edge and the good dad project came from the So amazing yeah. how many local guys are like big time famous from Desmet. yeah it's funny because uh uh i grew up in the rittner school district and, and they had good coaches and good players as well but uh my dad uh, decided to send my brother ted and i to chaminade and uh so i was there my freshman year and then uh, my dad uh, came home one day and said no oh, we're going to send you to Desmet, and, and, and i want you to work under and play for coach Rich Grower. And I said, oh, okay, I guess I'm going to DeSmet. So, uh, <laughs> so yeah, that's kind of how it was. And, um, you know, DeSmet was a, uh, and has been, and even back then, uh, as a new school, back when I was there, it was probably only the sixth or seventh year it was in existence. Oh, wow. uh, and uh, it was a newer school, but for, for whatever reason, uh, they, they, they had great sports teams and uh, great coaches and it's just being and for me and, and and just being at the right place at the right time yeah coach grower is just such a great guy what i know of him i know his sons uh i get i go to church with his sons and uh seeing them and seeing their athletic ability or lack thereof but there's determination and coaching that they've got and playing basketball with them and uh his sons have gone on to play high level stuff as you know so it's not like they uh they uh, missed, missed the mark when it came to basketball, you know, uh, division one, uh, one of them got to go to the elite eight, uh, on his team and all that. So really, really, uh, neat kids, the ones that I know, and then you get into play for his dad. I did, I did not know that prior to today that he was the coach at DeSmet. I knew obviously he coached for SLU, uh, college, and did for many, many years. So I got to watch, get to know him through watching slew basketball, but like that had to be incredible playing for coach Grower in high school. 
Yeah, it really was. It was uh, it was a blessing for me. It wasn't always easy. He was very demanding, and very you know, demanding. I was a I was a big guy. I was a good athlete, but I wasn't a very good basketball player. And so he got a hold of me, and my dad was uh, had a lot of wisdom by by sending me over there because I, you know, Coach Grier was responsible for for uh, for a lot of things in my life, and, uh, and when it comes to basketball, and even beyond that, uh, I. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I, you know, Tom Landry, the famous uh, Dallas Cowboys uh, coach, a legendary coach, was uh, quoted as saying, my job as a coach is to make my players do what they don't want to do so they they can become the players and the men that they, they want to become. And uh, and that's I always thought that was a great quote. I read that many years ago and it was it was. Um, uh, indicative of what uh, Coach Brower did to me. I mean, he said, "This is this is how it's going to go, and if you don't like it, you know, you can leave. But this is what we're going to do." <laughs> I said, "Okay." And it was very difficult at times, but yet he knew what he was doing, and I needed to be pushed. And hit the bar at the Smet was very high, and so compared to a lot of other schools. And so this is what the expectations are, and uh, and this is what we're going to do to meet those expectations. And if you don't want to do it, then there's the door. And uh, it was very black and white, no nonsense approach. But he, 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 he was a great teacher of the game of basketball. Uh, he had us well prepared in, uh, for each and every game. Heck, we won. My junior and senior year, we won 60 games in a row in, in two state championships. <laughs> so we had good teams, but uh, it was – we, we had some talented players, but I think the, the way the, the, the main reason why we won was our coaching staff and, and mainly coach Grower getting us prepared to play. That's awesome. What, uh, what type of lessons can you look back and go, man, that one stuck with me. And that was, that was a good one. You know, um, a lot, I mean, just good old fashioned self-discipline, um, you know, doing a little bit extra, um, uh, you know, I think that, you know, you take a lot of things from your coaches. Coaches have a, a big influence on players, uh, young young men. And, uh, you know, Coach Grower, who I actually see a lot today even. Uh, I see him every couple of weeks. Uh, we've been attending the same Bible study for, I don't know, 10 years every other Tuesday evening. How cool is that? And, uh, and so he's just a wealth of knowledge even today. And he, he's, he's helped uh, – He's helped me out uh, a lot, and my parents as well with his uh, with what he's doing now. Uh, with, with he does a lot of social security and Medicare type of advisement, and uh, so anyway, so he uh, he's a he's a wealth of knowledge even today, and uh, he uh, you know he like I said before, I, I, you know expectations were uh, our normal just meant was was high. Our normal. He, you know, when you play sports at a higher level, even even in high school, but when you get to the college level, your normal is is really, really high because you're expected to, you know, practice and perform at a high level and do hard things on the court and uh, in school. And then you, you do that for four years in high school and college even. And all of a sudden that's normal to you. And it, but it's really not normal for most people. So that's your, your new normal. But you know, when I teach my kids and I've coached a little bit off and on over the years and, and, and I, I guess my takeaway was from, from coach Grower in my high school days and the whole coaching staff there, uh, Dale Bergman was the coach as well, but, uh, was, you know, do hard things, you know, and, mm -hmm. and I try to get my kids to, to do hard things and, you know, you don't always going to feel like it and, and, and feelings, really aren't your guide aren't your master it's it's your mind it's like i know i'm supposed to do this in the off season i don't feel like it but i want to achieve my goals and so i i just do it and i think that's what men do and, and the, the motto with the smet was men for others and um and that was our kind of it still is today obviously but uh and so you know the word man you know teaching us how to be men and how to be able to succeed in life well after high school and beyond and you know hopefully have a wife and a family and kids someday and a job and 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 go out in the world and get your your piece of the pie so to speak and uh and and dismet really uh prepared me for that in, in many ways and, and especially you know the classroom as well as the uh on the basketball court mm. two two things you said there so my daughter's now when we when we're looking at options and things that we the approaches way we could do things 
we've got the easy road and the hard road. Hey girls, we could go this way and this way will be pretty easy, you know, a little bit shorter. And, you know, this is the result we'll get to, or we could do it this way. That's the hard way. And what we'll get is, you know, this, that, and the other. And my daughters look at me and they, let's do it the hard way, dad. We do hard things. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, character and, 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 uh, is really developed in times of ease. And I think that, uh, you know, you know, as men, we're called to be, you know, men of action. I got a 16 year old boy. And I was just telling me the other day, I said, Luke, you know, you're just not a boy anymore, but you're, yeah, yeah, you're a man, but you're becoming a man. And just always keep in the back of your mind that you want to be action oriented. Um, men you know take action and uh um and, and i think if you have that philosophy in life that as your default a thought in life is you know i'm going to be action oriented because we all have to fight laziness and procrastination and isolation as men we we, we fight that and we fight that battle but we gladly fight that battle because you know we have a proclivity toward those things uh, and, and they're not healthy and 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 and, and if they're not in balance and uh and so we, we wake up every morning and we we do hard things things we don't feel like doing you know going to work and you know doing what we need to do as men but we're also action oriented and i heard this saying many many years ago and it really stuck out it said if you do nothing nothing will happen <laughs> and you know just do something and i was at chaminade this is a this was something that, that kind of stuck out with me and i was a freshman football player at chaminade and, you know, none of us really ever played, you know, I actually played some little league football, but uh, most guys didn't, didn't. And, uh, you know, we didn't even know how to put our shoulder pads on and everything, but, you know, so it's our first game and we're sitting there and we're all nervous. We're playing, I think, Viani and we're, uh, we're freshmen and, oh, and uh, yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and our coach uh, said, okay, fellas, you know, got us together and says, you get out there, you get confused, say you forget to play, you don't know what to do, just hit somebody just go hit somebody. If you don't know what to do, just go hit somebody. And, and that is really kind of an interesting, uh, uh, philosophy in life. If you don't know what to do. Just do something, go hit, you know, go do something. I don't know what to do. We'll do something, you know? Uh, and so that was a takeaway. And I remember that even from my freshman year, which would have been 19, gosh, 75 or something. And, uh, and I remember that like it was yesterday. It's like, just don't know what to do. You get discom you get confused. You forget to play. Just go hit somebody. <laughs> and oh, uh, it was good advice. That is good advice. That is good advice. The uh, high level is normal like that. And the environment you were in, you didn't know any different. And I love being around high level people and doing high level things because it's just normal. Like I remember playing soccer after we were out of high school and I was playing on a team of all American soccer players. I was not the greatest soccer player. I could play, but I wasn't high level like that. And just seeing how they move the ball and just being a part of that working unit. I'm like, man, I look like a good player out here with these guys. Cause as soon as the ball comes to me, I just move it really quickly away from me to one of them. And then they do something special with it. Now I, I fit in like, this is cool. <laughs> Yeah, you know, there's always another level out there. But when you're playing with when you have good coaching, and you're playing with good athletes, it, it's easier. It's, it's more of a more of a, it, it just makes, you know, and you're winning games. And it's, 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 it, it's, what you just mentioned is, is, is true, you just become part of the process. And you know what your strengths are, you know, what your weaknesses are, and everybody does. And, you know, you play into your strengths and you become part of a team and that hopefully is very successful. I was uh, talking to a guy the other day who went through Bud's class, the Navy SEAL training, and he mentioned that he went to Bud's class, but he didn't say I'm a Navy SEAL. I'm like, oh, something happened. And we had just competed in a uh, half marathon and that guy was just yeah. tearing it up and he was carrying extra weights with him and everything. So I knew he wasn't somebody that uh, lacked mental strength. And I say, hey, what happened? And he goes, well, yeah, there's a story. He says, I was picking up this big log with my boat crew and it was the heaviest log any of us had ever lifted during all of training. And all of us looked at each other and we're like, what is this thing? There's no way. Is and I'm underneath it and I'm struggling and I hear these pops and his back compacted and compressed and broke his spine. 
Yikes. Yeah. I'm like, and then you just dropped out. He goes, no, no, no. I didn't drop out. I kept going. As I put the thing on my head and I was trying to push up and trying to keep going and we finished and then we kept doing other things as a team and everything. And finally my team's like, you've got to drop out because you were messing this team up so bad. And he's like, I wasn't going to quit, not on my team, but when they told me to get the heck out because I'm messing them up, he's like, I was just in that high level mindset and environment where there's nothing going to stop me except, you know, broken vertebrae that <laughs> wouldn't yeah. allow me to physically yeah. you know, stay yeah. at that level anymore. Well, that, that, that type of mental toughness is what we all want to achieve for and strive for and hopefully have people in our lives that push us further beyond what we, we think we're capable of doing so we can achieve that mental toughness. And that, that you know, that's just a big key in life. Uh, I don't know if, for, for who you are. I have six kids and I'm always trying to figure out ways to, you know, motivate them or encourage them or trying to get them to the next level. And, and uh, you know, you, you want, you want, you uh, you, and even the, the teams that I've coached and everything, you just you're, you're always trying to 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 get get them to believe in themselves more than they do uh, currently, and you're also trying to get them to that next level. And you know, you can always do more. Your mind is going to, you know, your body can always do more than what you think you can, mm -hmm. and and that's what you have to believe, and that's what you have to strive for. And it's not easy, and uh, it's just easy to, to not go easier to not go there. And again, do hard things. It's harder to go there, but once you go there, you can achieve great things. Yep. Absolutely. So let's transition a bit to the, to the kind of the next phase. You got to play for Mizzou and not only that, you got to play for another legendary coach. Yeah. Norm Stewart. Uh, yeah. I, I was very highly recruited coming out of high school. I was, you could have played anywhere. Yeah, I could have. I was probably one of the top two or three most highly recruited players uh, in the country my senior year. Back then, you can take six six college visits. And so I visited UCLA, Kentucky, North Carolina, <laughs> uh, Duke, uh, Notre Dame, and Mizzou, University <laughs> of Missouri. So those are my six visits. And I I uh, ended up going to the University of Missouri. And, and, uh, uh, and you know, we had great teams. I mean, we, we had a good coach, coach, uh, uh, coach Stewart was very similar to Rich Grower and, and, yeah. and, uh, and he was very, uh, uh, very demanding. Uh, demanding, but also a teacher of, uh, the fundamentals of the game, nothing fancy. This is what we're going to do. And this is how you very specific in the breakdown of where your body parts are supposed to be and how you do a pick and roll and how you, you know, do certain things very fundamentally sound. And it always goes back to the fundamentals. I mean, if, if you're a golfer and you, you know that very well, it's like, oh man, I just go, is my, you always go back to the, the, is my grip good? Is my, is my, is my stance good? I mean, you always go back to the fundamentals. And so, so he was a teacher of those. And, and, and my goodness, we had, uh, in, in four years, we won over a hundred games, um, Back then, it was the Big Eight. We won four Big Eight championships in a row. We had, uh, I think, a couple different times we were ranked number one in the nation. Uh, it, you know, we never made it to the Final Four, which was uh, at two of those years. We were very good. We we had chances to 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 get there. Uh, we had a good path to get there that was doable, and we we didn't we didn't make. We always fell short in the tournament, and that that, that was disappointing. But uh, other than that, it was, we, we won a lot of games and, and beat a lot of really good teams. What were some things that, uh, Storm and Norman put into your life coach? Uh, I don't know. He, he was, uh, he was always very demanding. He was coach Stewart is an interesting guy. Um, great coach, but he also had a great sense of humor and uh, a lot of people, uh, probably haven't seen that side of him he uh if you see him today uh, he's the same age as my dad he's 85 i believe oh wow maybe 86 but still gets around and and uh you know he's a very engaging very funny guy and uh but he was uh he was very demanding and uh um you know i don't know i think just more the same more the same of um you know, you got school to deal with in college, which was 
in some ways I was, I was prepared for because at the Smet, you know, you came home from practice, you ate and you did three hours of homework. That was the normal. And, and yeah, so I, I was yeah. used to, I was capable of spending a lot of hours studying uh, where a lot of the kids that, that, that I went to college with my freshman year, they, they weren't used to that. And uh, so I was able to, you know, so school is much more demanding. It seemed like in college, um, there's more distractions, of course, but uh, uh, we, we spent a lot of time, uh, you know, playing the game, I guess, you know, what I, what I take away from my days of playing in the NBA and then uh, college and high school, just being around the guys, you know, being around a group of same group of guys in the locker room after wins, after losses, uh, there's nothing better. And uh, so that's, that's what I miss is just the camaraderie that when you go into battle daily and then you go play these big games, um, you know, you go into battle with people and it's, 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 it's intense and it's, it's, you know, your national TV and, you know, your, your, you know, fans, every place is always a sellout in high school. If you didn't get to the game three hours ahead of time, you didn't get in. And then college was the same. I don't, I don't think we've ever played in, in something that wasn't sold out in four years of uh, college. And then, uh, so, you know, you're always under the microscope and you, you really have to, um, you know, there's just a lot going on emotionally and physically and mentally. And, and uh, I don't know if I was prepared for that, but you, you get, you get, uh, you, you need, you, you, you just have to deal with that. It's, it's a lot more than just what someone sees at, at, at a game. I'm going to turn on the game on Saturday afternoon and watch Mizzou play, you know, whoever, uh, Kansas or Oklahoma or whatever it was. And, and you see the game and, and it's a good game and everything. And we might've won, we might've lost, but, but there's a lot that goes into that uh, behind the scenes. And, uh, some of it's good and some of it's very challenging, and there's some things you just don't care for, but you know, uh, anyway, so I'm rambling on, but yeah, uh, no, no, no. I, you're kind of leading right to a question that I had, uh, being well-known notoriety, you know, the size that you were growing up, you know, stood out from a crowd. I was talking to Orlando Pace about that a while back and Orlando's like, oh yeah, everybody knew me. You know, I was 14 years old. Everybody knew who I was in his little town of Sandusky, Ohio. Um, and you, you mentioned pressure how did whether it was the pressure of being known or the pressure of big moments in your life how have you worked through pressure yeah i think that's a good question i think i don't know if i was well prepared for that uh um uh, and, and so when i deal with kids that i coach or have coach i don't coach anymore but uh, or my own kids I, I i tend to focus more on the the mental emotional aspect of sports i had three three daughters that played high college bat, basketball and volleyball so oh, wow. so my instruction to them was not so much x's and o's or because that you know they got coaches to tell them that i i i I'd sprinkle in some things here and there but <laughs> But it's just mainly, you know, the mental, emotional part of it, because people don't realize how hard a division one athlete uh, athletics are. And uh, and if you're prepared mentally and even more so, maybe emotionally to handle the stress and the pressures that come your way, you're going to be well ahead of the game. And I think that's a, a muscle or a skill that needs to be um, taught to any youngster. Uh whether an athlete or not at a young age. And, uh, and, and it's a process, of course, it's a marathon, not a sprint, but if you can pepper in little uh, words of wisdom when it comes to how to deal with the stresses of life, uh, you're doing a, a big uh, benefit and service uh, to your kids. That's for sure. Yeah, absolutely. No doubt about it. Like so many lessons are learned through sports and through work that translate into other aspects of our yeah. lives. So uh, with COVID and the lack of some sports and different things, I'm like, man, we're, we're missing some lessons. We got to figure out ways to help create those for our kids and right. give them some adversity. And, and not that there's not adversity in isolation and things like that as well, but it's like, we got to pick up and learn, learn on those moments for sure. So you you had a pretty decent NBA career. Uh, you were like that solid guy. Always put up 10, got 10 boards, a uh, great teammate from what I understand. And then, uh, you know, as a lot of athletes that play pro or, you know, going up, 
we all have injuries that take us out. How were you able to, to like cope with that? Cause that was a, a pretty quick transition. Yeah, it was, um, the pros was, I enjoyed, I enjoyed high school as well. And I still keep in contact with a lot of my high school teammates here in St. Louis, but, uh, the, uh, NBA was fun. It was, it was hard. It was by far the hardest, but it was the most fun, uh, at, uh, season of basketball i guess in my life but uh yeah you know it's 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 a, it's a great it was great i played five years and uh before i hurt my knee hurt my left knee and uh spent two years up in indianapolis to play for the indiana, indiana pacers i was a high draft pick for them and uh uh loved loved the city of indianapolis loved my teammates and coaches uh i wish it would have lasted longer but after I got hurt toward the end of my fifth year with kind of an odd kind of a, it's called avascular necrosis. It's a lack of blood supply in a part of your knee. And, uh, and it doesn't happen very often and no one knows why, whether it was this kind of a trauma that caused mm -hmm. it or just whatever, but it just slowly started hurting more and more. And so I go to training camp, my, my sixth year, I started hurting at the end of my fifth year and, but it would, it would settle down after the game started a little bit. And I was able to finish the season without missing any games. And then that summer I kept telling like, we always go up to Indianapolis and play ball. And they, I kept telling, I said, man, my, my knees hurt. And I'll like, oh, just take it easy. So I just got married. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, so I was like, okay, I'll just take it easy. I'll go to training camp. What would have been my sixth year. I kept telling these guys, my knees kind of hurt. Oh, I'll just take it easy, you know. <laughs> so we were playing a, a, an exhibition game. We we're playing the Dallas, Dallas Mavericks actually at home. And I was like, man, I hate, yeah. you know, there's a lot of pain in his knee. And they go, okay, okay, we're going to get it checked out. So finally. And then, uh, so we get an MRI and CAT scan and all that. And it's just a big black spot there, just lack of blood supply. So I've had seven knee operations on that knee. Wow. And, uh, two right away. And, and spent two years just living in Indianapolis, hoping to, uh, to, to get back and with the team and, and get healed up. I just figured, well, I got an injury. It should, you know, it should heal up like any injury. Uh, but never did to the point where you, you can play in the NBA. And I remember I was, one of my doctors was in California, Santa Barbara, California. So I was there, uh, and it was, it was the go, no go decision. I guess what would have been my seventh year. Uh, they were saying, okay, you know, we're going to, you're going to keep Steve. Is he good enough to play or is we cut him loose? And so the doctor says his knee is not good enough. It won't ever be able to good, be good enough to play in the NBA. So mm. that, that's how it all kind of went down. I was like, man, I guess I'm done. It was kind of odd. I had to, my wife was second pregnant with a second kid at the time. And, and so we were just like, okay, we're out of here. Uh, I guess that's that season of my life is over. And so we just moved on. And you're just at peace with it or. Yeah. Uh, I remember a couple of years after that, I was feeling pretty good and the Pacers flew me up there and they wanted to see if, uh, if I was able to play. And I took like, gosh, I took like, you know, MRIs on every body part and they looked at it and they were there. They were going, Steve, we, we want you to come back. This was like two or three years after and I was like, okay, yeah, I'll come back. And, and, uh, but even then, you know, they took all the x-rays and everything and they said, ah, we, we just don't think it's going to happen. So, yeah, you know, you, you try, uh, you, you exhaust all your options cause it's a, it's a great living and it's, a, it's, it's, it's what you, you want to be able, if you can do it, you want to do it. If there's any possibility. And then at some point the door gets shut and you're like, okay, well it's over. So life goes on. Yeah. I've had a, a lot of professional athletes I've talked to and they either retired by choice or they retired by injury or uh, whatever it was. And a lot of them have said, Hey, I went through a severe depression or they, when they were talking to me, they said, Hey, I am severely depressed. I don't know how to transition my life. I, I don't get the thrills anymore. I don't have the teammates anymore. I don't have the structure, the discipline. I don't have a direction in life, all these different angles, but bottom line is they're like, how do I fill the void without sports? Yeah. I mean, it's just like anything. I mean, I think that, uh, uh, um, I think I, mean, I, didn't, I didn't really go through that. I mean, I've been playing kind of high level sports since high school and, and I was kind of like, okay, it's over. And now there's like 10 things I really want to do that I can never been able to do. So I, I took more of a positive outlook on it and just thought, you know, okay, you know, it's, 
you know, and, 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 uh, and, and I was doing some things that I, I always really wanted to do and, and kind of thought, well, you know, that season's over. What can I do to, what can I do now? And, uh, I was excited about, I was more of a, I was more excited about, um, the next chapter than disappointed that the, the, the that one chapter was over. So, so I didn't go through any of that really. Okay. Well, that's fantastic. I wasn't expecting to hear that. Good for you. And faith play any part in that? Yeah. I became a Christian when I was at, uh, uh, junior in, at Mizzou. And, okay. uh, so of course, um, that was always been a big part of my life. And, you know, it's, that's a journey. I mean, that's, that's, I look back at in 1982 when I first became a Christian and I, 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 uh, I, I, uh, and I look back and go, Oh my gosh, I was so young and so immature and in so many ways, but, uh, uh, but yeah, oh yeah. Christianity. I don't know how people make it. I mean, we talk about the stresses of life. You talk about, uh, you know, the, the ups and downs and the circumstances that can change drastically. Uh, what levels all that out is just a, a trust or faith in God. God's in control. I'm not, uh, I trust in that he, he does a better job of taking care of me than I can certainly do myself. And, uh, so that, that refuge and that, that, um, comfort knowing that, you know, I'm loved by God, no matter what, um, uh, my sins are forgiven and that God does have a plan. And I, and I trust in that. Now I have to preach that to myself a lot because you, you kind of, you kind of, you know, it's a battle, it's a battle. And, um, uh, but, uh, it is, it is, it is, uh, something that that i think about often when i when i when it comes to these young kids today that i see and i still have two in high school and um and uh you know just how, how do you make it through the, the 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 trials and the tribulations and the good times and the bad times without without a strong faith in, in god uh, i don't know how they do it so i try to promote that as well when i talk to people so you said you said when you were a was it junior at mizzou Yes. Okay. Junior at Mizzou. So you'd gone to uh, Christian schools growing up. Yeah, uh, I did. I went to uh, Catholic grade school and Catholic high schools, but you know, there's a dynamic there. I mean, you got to be, you know, they, they say a lot of the things about Jesus and all that, but you got to be ready to yeah. really, really know what that, you know, really accept that and really want to make that a, a big part of your life. And uh, so I, um, you know, to me, it was just, you know, I'm, I'm a Catholic and that's yeah. what I am. And there was no, you know, you can call it a personal relationship or right. Jesus knowing him intimately and, and really understanding it becomes it, it becomes a relationship versus just kind of a religious social thing that you do and i drew comfort from that I, don't get me wrong but uh it was when i really understood the uh, saving power of jesus and and and, and there's there actually a moment where you just have to you know what i need i need the forgiveness of my sins um, there's something missing drastically missing from my life that even though i was just a good athlete and having success um there was a void there was an emptiness and i i um you know i deeply you know realized that the, the, what the world offers isn't isn't satisfying compared to what god offers us uh through a relationship with the son jesus and and i i i realized that at, uh back back in college and i never looked back i mean it's just oh my gosh it's it's, uh, you know, you fill your cup with water that, that, uh, of the world and it seeps out, but you know, the water that the living water is, is so much better than the world's water. And, uh, you fill your cup every day with the living water, which is Jesus. And, and, and you're totally satisfied. You, you don't, you don't thirst for the, 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 the trappings or the, 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 uh, what we think is going to satisfy us. And, and, and there's a lot of good things out there. Don't get me wrong, but they're, they're second things compared to uh, the, our relationship with God through Jesus. The, the NBA like that to me seems like the ultimate uh, place where guys can just do majorly bad things. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
Yeah, I mean it's uh, it, it's like you, know, you can do bad things. So I don't care what, whatever yeah. season you're at. But uh, you know, I was always fortunate that I, our our team was was always a bunch of you know good guys. You know, we didn't uh, you hear about things. You know, here's what the Lakers are doing. This like you believe you hear things. You know, of course you, those you guys. Know. <laughs> uh, but we were just kind of just you know a bunch of good guys, and we hung out and. Uh, several of them were married, but most of us weren't at the time. We just practices over at one. Okay, what are we going to do today? Let's go to the movies. Let's go. I mean, you hang out with 12 guys for yeah. seven, eight months of the year and nine months, really. So and you become really good friends. And that's, that's what I miss. The NBA camaraderie was, was far superior than, than high school and college. And we, we got, to, you get to know these guys and, and, uh, you do everything with them. And, you know, I really miss the locker room after games. We sit around, they always had beer in the locker room. We sit around and have a couple of beers and yeah. talk about the game and laugh and, and, uh, those days that's what i really miss is is those times um in the locker room after games especially on the road nothing going on you sit around and, and uh uh but i was always fortunate we had good guys on our team they didn't do it you know there wasn't any crazy stuff going on we were i guess probably pretty boring you know <laughs> compared to stuff <laughs> was, compared to what you can conjure up in your mind what these guys are doing we we just uh we, we just played ball and kind of hung out. It was pretty innocent, really. So funny. The images you've got in your mind and ideas of what things might be like. And I remember one time, the first time I ever got to go backstage at a rock concert. Oh, my gosh. And yeah. hang out with the band. And they weren't doing any of the things that I thought they'd be doing. They're talking about, you know, how to promote albums and how to how to get in newspapers and marketing and like it's business was happening after the concert <laughs> they're having a little bit of fun they're you know, enjoying themselves but they weren't at all doing yeah you know it. it's you 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 can't this lifestyle that people it, it's it's not sustainable i mean you you flame out i mean i've seen guys do it you know and and they it's it's uh it's short-lived and 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 you have to take care of yourself it's almost like your body becomes your source of income so you you know you you become uh, very aware of of what you're what you can and can't do to be able to perform your best and there are guys you know fighting for jobs and and uh every year and, and and your statistics and how you know you know determine what you know, how much money you're going to make in your next contract i mean they take it very seriously so yeah yeah absolutely so transition from the nba and you mentioned getting married in your young nba career and now you said six kids which is unbelievable to me <laughs> having yeah. two two are two are a big enough handful for me uh what type of things have you learned as a parent now on the on the flip side of it so we talked about growing up how have you applied different things and then learned different things as, as a parent? Yeah, I don't know. I'm mean, have six kids and my oldest is 31. I got three son-in-laws, three grandkids, and I have a, a senior daughter and a, a sophomore son. So I have five daughters and one son. The son, uh, Luke is the youngest and he's a sophomore in high school. And, uh, so I've been married, I think 32 years. <laughs> and, um, and so, um, yeah, I mean, people think that, you know, oh, Steve, give us your wisdom. What can you learn? I said, you know, I tell you what, uh, what's the formula? I said, well, the formula is there is no formula. I mean, uh, you know, you, you, it, it's not something that you can say, do this, this, and this, and this will happen. This positive outcome will happen when it comes to kids. And I learned that very young and uh and it's so true it's just it, it's you know and my 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 kids have you know one one played a volleyball at university of arkansas and uh, my one daughter played basketball at St. university she was actually the leading scorer uh all-time leading scorer when she graduated a few years ago and then uh uh my one daughter played uh, division two uh, basketball uh at a school in in, in state of washington uh, western washington so um so they are out there you know doing stuff and like i said three of them are married and and um so we got an interesting dynamic where we got kids and in, 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 you know it's 31 with kids and then and then, and then you know a sophomore you know so yeah 
it is an interesting dynamic. We just kept having kids and, and we loved it. And uh, it was very challenging and talk about do hard things. My wife can do hard <laughs> things. That's for sure. Uh, and, uh, you know, and, and it's, it's a process, uh, you know, you make mistakes as a parent, we all do, but your kids can absorb a lot of that. And, uh, and you just, you just, the, the challenge to me is invigorating. I, I wake up every day and, you know, I, I, I try to solve problems or try to get, we need money for this, you know, Emma's going to college, you know, mm-hmm. you know, you know, so you, uh, I call it entering the battle of life gladly. And to me, it would be quite boring if I didn't wake up every day and, and I didn't have, you know, challenges um, with all my kids, you know, how, how can I relate better to my, you know, to Kelly, who's, you know, 30 and, you know, am I doing a good job, even though she's 30 and has a husband, I mean, what's my role, you know, or Emma is, uh, you know, Last night they lost by you know a couple points in her basketball game and she's oh. devastated. So I gotta you know comfort her and you know and, yeah. then, and then uh, you know okay she's you know I mean it's always something. I mean Luke just started driving a month ago and you know you know so you know I gotta you know deal with him and his issues and you know it's just always something. But it's it's actually the 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 stress of that or the challenge of that is 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 the impetus for a lot of growth. I think that if I was just sitting around fat, dumb, and happy and and didn't have, you know, the challenges of, 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 of raising these kids. I, I would have, uh, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have uh, a lot of the character traits I have now. I wouldn't have developed strong, you know, emotional, spiritual muscles uh, that can only come through, through stress and, and dealing with problems. So I gladly accept it. It's not easy because a lot of times you don't know what the heck to do. And so you, you just have to figure it out. And it's like any dad, any, any business owner, any athlete, any coach, any, anything you're, you got young kids still, but it's, it's still, uh, you just, it's a constantly constant trying to figure it out. And, and, but that's a good, you embrace that. You don't run from it. You embrace it, I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah. That's a, a heck of a way to look at it is the opportunity, the hope, the challenge, the, you know, let's go, let's go versus oh can you believe it again <laughs> well you have those days I mean, let me just tell you but they're, they're short-lived and you, you 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 get on your knees a lot and pray i mean you can't you can protect your you got daughters it's like mm-hmm. oh my gosh you drop drop your daughter off to college that is you want you want to cry like a baby that was me it's like oh my god it's just your little girl's going to college and 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 has no idea the pitfalls that can be there, you know, so you, you just get on your knees and pray because, you know, you can't always protect your kids and you got daughters, especially it's like, man, I can't, I can't, you know, I got one lives in Seattle and one, one in Denver and one in Chicago and, and, uh, you know, I can't help them anymore. I mean, I, I, I but God can. And so I, I lean on God. I'm a big believer in prayer and, uh, for your kids. And I do that, uh, obviously, uh, like a lot of men do, but I really take that very seriously because I, I got to give up control. I can't protect them. I can't, you know, but God can, and I rest in that. Yeah. I, I love the power of prayer and I love praying with my kids Yeah, individually as a group. And right now I'm it's kind of funny thinking about what God can do. Well, it's really easy to say anything. God can do anything. Well, what if I pray for this? Yeah. (laughs) Well, now if Steve prays for that, he can, he can do anything that Steve prays for. But you know, when it's me personally, I'm like, man, how big can I ask? And I know, you know, in concept, anything I want, I can ask for, but I was reading a story in the Bible and this lady says, uh, Hey, you guys are running out of food. You're running out of water. Everybody's cranky and saying, give up. And you guys bargained with them. And you said, ah, our God's a good God. And we'll do this for five more days. Give us five more days. Don't kill us. You know, give us five more days or, and then we'll, then we'll, then we'll give up. We'll throw the right flag. We'll let the enemy take it, take over. And she goes, our God is much stronger than that. I'm going to take care of business. You guys stink. You guys don't really have faith. And she goes out through the walls, goes over to the enemy camp, starts talking to him, says some stuff, whatever it is. And next thing you know, she turns the whole thing and she comes back with the leader of the enemy's head in her hand. It's like, Hey, here you go. 
<laughs> what faith is about. And I'm like, whoa, you single handedly turned the tide on this. And after she left, she goes, guys, I'm not going to tell you my plan. After she left the walls, she's like, all right, now, now what's next, God? <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, you got to have hope. And I think hope is the key to a lot of things in life. But, uh, you know, you have to have hope that you could solve problems and you could, you know, that there's there's always a solution. And that's one thing I teach my kids. I said, there's always a solution. Just relax, you know, that what's the solution? And uh, there's always a solution out there. We just got to, you know, you got to dive in. And, and, of course, prayer is where you start. But then again, you got to be action oriented. You got to do something. If you don't sit around and wait for, you know, the answer to drop on your head, then, then you know, you just got to do something. That, that, that young lady, that lady took action. She didn't just sit there and God deliver me. You know, she went and did something and, and it worked out. But, uh, and that's where I said earlier, you got to be action oriented. And of course, we all want wisdom. We want wisdom that comes from God. We want to make the right decision. So we pray for that. Uh, we, we start doing things. We start moving in a certain direction. If God's in it, it it'll work out. If he's not, then you say, okay, I'll turn over another rock, you know, and see what's going on. But it's all action oriented. It's, um, trusting God, doing hard things. The things we've been talking about, uh, this morning are all kind of related. Uh, but at the end of the day, you gotta have hope. You gotta have a hope that good is just right around the corner, that God has nothing but what's best for you. And you rest in that. I love that idea of rest in that. I was interviewing a guy yesterday, uh, a guy named John Stange. He's got a book coming out called uh, Dwelling in These Things. Mm. And it's like, just rest in, rest in the Lord, rest in the Bible verse and passage. And, you know, just relish the thought yeah. of how much God loves you. And yeah. you mentioned praying for wisdom. And it's like, God just keeps revealing things over and over and over again. And we just got to be one. We've got to ask. He's not there to tell us what to do. He, he wants us to ask, meet him halfway. And uh, so, yeah, I love that. Well, it's a mystery in some ways where God uh, chooses to somehow partner with us. Yeah, we ask and we do, but, but without, you know, see, without what's just saying, it says without, without him, I can't without me, he won't. So it's like, okay, it's like this mistress, mysterious partnership. You know, I need God, but he needs me to act as well. And, it, and it's somewhat of a mystery to me anyway. It's like, okay, well, that's how God designed it. So that's what I'm going to do. So it's funny, the mystery. I'll throw this one to you and see, uh, see how you react to it. My eight-year-old daughter, we we're having a discussion last night. And somehow it comes to the uniqueness of each individual and how God individually loves us, talks to us. And she says, well, dad, here's the thing. There's a whole bunch of them out there. And I said, oh, I'm going to be curious here for a minute and see where she's going with this. I'm like, like, what do you mean? Like, tell me, tell me more about that thought. And she says, well, you know, he's got, he's, he's recreated himself a whole bunch of times. Okay. Such as she's like, you know, like the Holy spirit. Okay. And Jesus. And I'm like, well, the Holy spirit is I'm like, who's that? Well, that's God. Okay. And Jesus? Well, yeah, that's God. Okay. And he's just made a whole bunch of them. <laughs> that's interesting. <laughs> that's pretty, that's pretty, that's pretty sharp. She's pretty sharp. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So, so I just sort of sat there with that and kept talking to her a little that I said, I don't think that's exactly how that works. Uh, I, I got, and you mentioned mystery. I'm like, that is a mystery though. Like that's a heck of a one to work on. And she's like, well, dad, that's where I'm at. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Don't, don't give me any advice right now. That's how I see it. And that's, and that's good enough for me. And that's, that's what I would do. I'd say that's good. Good job. <laughs> you figured so, it out. <laughs> so somehow the Trinity was millions and millions, hundreds of millions of individual gods, <laughs> but <laughs> It was really just the Trinity who was really yeah. actually all in one, but somehow that made sense to her. Yeah. yeah amen. <laughs> That's good stuff. <laughs> good stuff. So it's funny how you learn from, uh, from the minds of kids. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. The so. different perspectives that they have and everything. So there's I miss, I'm, 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 I'm jealous. I miss those young girls. Those, 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 those that age, I don't have that age around anymore. Those, yeah. Uh, so you had five girls 
and your wife. So you had six females in your household before your son Luke came around. I've, yeah. I've only got three. <laughs> Yeah, I learned a lot of lessons. No, no question. My wife taught me uh, one one of them that I, I I always struggled with is the whole emotional part of it. And uh, I, you know, they would come home from school, oh, you know, devastated over some relationship issue or some drama. That, and I would, go, okay, okay, you know, we're, I guess we're switching schools. I guess or whatever. And I'm like, I get all flustered, and my wife goes, just don't even pay any attention to that tomorrow. It won't even be, be a big deal. I go, okay. And so <laughs> tomorrow I was like, nothing ever happened the day before. So this whole emotional stuff that I, I, I need to enter into it a little bit more because I, I don't quite understand it. Cause, uh, but I, I, I learned that that's one lesson that I learned that the drama that the, that, that these young girls kind of go through, uh, the roller coaster is just don't even go there. Just, just be a, a stable force and don't let that it's not a big deal. In other words, at the end of the day, I mean, you know, so that, that's one lesson that I learned early on. And it's, that, it's, one, that one's a huge one. And I've, <laughs> I've been is. learning that lesson yeah. a lot, even at the younger ages, my daughter was turning seven and she was having her fancy birthday party. And this girl she invited, she decided she wanted to uninvite days before the party and leading up to it. She kept getting on me and my wife you know, uninvite her, uninvite her, uninvite her, uninvite her. We're like, what do we do? Do we tell her to uninvite the girl? Do we call the parent? Like, oh, what's all this about? And then on a Friday before the party on Saturday, she she's talking about this girl coming to her party and, and a smile on her face. And I'm saying, hey, it seems like your opinion changed. What uh, what changed? She goes, oh, she said hi to me today. Yeah, I know. That's goofy stuff. You know, like, I'm like, yeah. are you kidding me? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I'm with you. I don't, <laughs> you know, so I don't remember that with guys, you know, I don't no. remember that growing up that way. So there's so many, different some ways girls, people talk about difficult girls are to me. It was, it was very easy compared to boys. I mean, Luke, I mean, girls always did what they're, you know, kind of, kind of, they wanted to please their dad. They kind of, they, they hated getting in trouble. You know, they did what they're supposed to do. They would not think they would never think of not doing their homework because they would get in trouble the next day. They would just do their homework. And Luke was like, I ain't doing my homework. So Luke, you're gonna get an F. I don't care. You know, I mean it's like <laughs> he it's a whole different uh, animal there, let me just tell you. So uh girls tend to be easier, I'm finding out, than boys. Um uh, a boy that is not uh, a boy that a boy can can uh a boy that never is is taught or the father doesn't enter into the life can wreak a lot of havoc on the world, you know, uh, more so than a girl in some ways. But uh, so I, I, I look at and again, my wife did a great job with the, with the girls. My wife is is uh, no nonsense approach. You know, you're going to do the dishes. I don't want to. You're going to do them. And, and enough said, or this is going to happen. And, and, and they do them, you know, you know, very simple, black and white, more of an authoritative, we have more of an authoritative approach to, to parenting. Uh, it seemed to work real well with us. It's like, this is, this is what you're going to do and do it. And, and they can argue all they want, but, but they're going to end up doing it. So, uh, so anyway, so we, we kind of have had that approach to, to parenting and, and, and that, that's the philosophy that I kind of believe in. <laughs> you absolutely do have to have, have that authoritarian uh, during, during different situations for sure. And yeah, you bring up the dishes, I kind of resonate there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's kind of like uh, my wife was raised that way. And of course I was as well. And, and, and we talk about the coaches that I've had and it's just, it, it's just it's kind of how we're kind of how we roll. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. As coaches for sure. Yeah, absolutely. There's a guy named um, Blake Brewer. He's got this thing called the legacy letter. Unfortunately, his father passed away, but immediately after his father passing, his mom says, Hey Blake, dad wrote, wrote you this letter. And so he's got a mission to, help a million dads write a letter to their kids so that the kids oh, know that yeah. they're loved, that they, their dad believes in them and that he's proud of them. And there's some other things in it as well. Yeah. 
If you oh, were that's, to... that's huge. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That is so huge. I talked to uh, different guys and they're like, wow, I either would love that for my dad or I got that for my dad. There's, you know, two different reactions to it. Right. Right. And then there's the realization of, oh my gosh, I haven't necessarily passed this on to my kids. Yeah, it's never too late, I guess. Uh, but, you know, that that's the struggle, I think. Every man's struggle is, is you know, to to love their the people in their lives well and not to isolate or not to withhold. But if you're going to err, err on the side of telling your kids you love them, uh, err on the side of, of getting involved and, and, and uh, be there, be present uh, when, you know, because we all have stresses of life. We're working, we're, you know, it can be overwhelming. And, and then all of a sudden, the things that are the most important to people, uh, they, uh, they tend to uh, get put in the back burner when that's always God's will for us. It's always about the people and about the relationships. You know, love God, love people. Work and everything, as good as that stuff is, is that uh, you, you, uh, you have to, uh, you know, keep that in its place. Uh, I have uh, kind of uh, five things that I kind of model my day after or my life after. And if I'm, I try to do one of those things 24 hours a day when I'm awake, well, when I'm awake, but uh, you got faith, uh, family, finances, friends, and fitness. So there's five F's and I try, and, and if I, I try to make sure I'm doing one of those. Entertainment's not in there, although I, I do dabble in that, but I try to keep that at a minimum. But if I'm doing something in, with my faith or my family or my finances, which is work um, and uh, friends and then fitness. So I try <laughs> to do one of those five things when I'm awake. <laughs> that's my, that's my go-to questions that I ask myself. Am I doing one of those five things? That's a great, great way to kind of filter things. I always like to include fun because sometimes I can personally <laughs> forget to just let loose and have fun and enjoy myself. And uh, that's like, I'm going to write that down. I can, might have to add that F in there. Yeah. <laughs> it's just a reminder. It's just a reminder. And uh, the longer I've been reminding myself, the more fun I've tended to have. And I always like to combine these activities too. So if my family can involve, be involved with something that involves faith that also ideally would involve fitness as well, maybe even a finance lesson comes up as we're doing something, whatever that might be like, these things are just so fit together when you start living in a way like this, like hiking is something me and my kids currently do. And yeah. in that we get to you know, experience all these different things and your kids being involved in basketball and volleyball and things like that. Those lessons, uh, there's a organization in town called all American athlete and they teach those lessons through basketball to girls oh, to help yeah. build confidence and life skills and stuff like that. Right. So yeah, your, your F's right there all fit together perfectly. And that's a great position to lead the family from. Yeah. Yeah. It's worked well for me. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, I was going to ask you for like parting advice and different things. And right there, that's some fantastic advice. <laughs> I think so. so. Yeah, I agree. And I'm, I'm right there on the apps. Cause I, I, that's one of my checklists as well. I'm always, always looking for that. Yeah. We like to finish, uh, finish the show out with a challenge. Have you got something you can think of to challenge Christian dads with maybe something to do this coming week? Oh, that's a good question. You should have told me that ahead of time. I could have, I could have thought about it more. Um, oh gosh. I think it's, I think that, um, yeah, good question. If I had one piece of advice, um, I think that, uh, I think the tendency for dads is to give way too much advice. And I think advice is important. I think that you need to give advice to your kids and kind of be there, you know. Uh, but I, 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 I pepper it in. My, my, what I want to do is give a lot of advice, but I have to restrain myself and just say, you know what? 
I'm going to pepper it in. And, uh, and there's different stages of your kid's life, of course, but I'm in kind of that high school stage with a couple of them. And, and even my older kids, it's, it's, I just, I, I, I'm just there for them. I love them. I'm there for them. I'm not the guy that's always going to come up with, well, you need to do this, 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 and this. I mean, it's a kiss of death in a, in a marriage as well, for that matter. But uh, I, I'm just, uh, I, I just, you know, just being, I'm a human being, just being there for them, uh, loving them, and keep the advice uh, to a, a minimum and, uh, and pepper it in words of wisdom uh, when, when you feel it, it's appropriate, but it should be less and not more. And, uh, so that's, that's, I, I say that probably because I'm, I'm, I'm working through that with my son who's, uh, 16 and that's kind of a, a lesson that I'm kind of learning more so than ever, um, with him. Cause I always want to tell him what to do and it's, <laughs> that doesn't work anyway. It does like talking to, to the coffee cup I'm looking at right now, but, uh, but uh, just loving him and being there and reassuring him and encouraging him. And um, I, I saw this the other day. Um, you're either reducing or expanding someone. And I never heard it quite that way. And, and, and so am I, are my words reducing that person or even myself for that matter, self-talk, or am I expanding that person, encouraging that person? Is it uplifting or is it... Um, not uplifting you know so <laughs> so i try to choose my words very carefully and uh, try to encourage more than uh more than anything at this age level and uh, let them know that i'm on their side there is a time for correction there is a time for boundaries there's a time for for uh discipline but uh, it's not going to be all the time so yeah, yeah. i don't yeah. know if that makes any sense or not but uh uh, no, it no, makes, it makes a ton, a ton of, sense. of sense. So the challenge I hear coming from that is, and when you mentioned reducing and expanding, it even changed the paradigm in my head. I think of us when as dads, as men, we love to problem solve. We love to give advice. Right. And so I see the challenge this week is to just plant in your head every time that you're about to give advice to stop for a second and think, is it needed right now? Is there a different way where I could maybe be curious, understand better, connect? And is there a question I can ask that can help expand who I'm talking to instead of reducing them by just solving it for them? Just yeah. you know, don't have to think. Yeah, that, I mean, that's a great way to look at it. And I agree with that. And I think that, uh, you know, choose your battles. Not everything is battle. Not everything's worth a battle. Just choose your battles wisely. And, uh, uh, and they're going to be, you know, err on the side of choosing less battles than, than more, <laughs> you know, there's always something, you know, it's a marathon. It's a marathon. Not, raising kids is a marathon, not a sprint. And, uh, you know, you, you, the tendency is to say, okay, I want, I want this, I want you to be this way in the, in the next week. Well, it's, it's a marathon and it's just a little bit here, a little bit there, loving your kids, love covers a multitude of sins. I mean, I could not be the best parent one day. I'm not going to beat myself up because my love for my kids and their love for me absorbs that. And I move on and God's mercies are new every morning and I uh, might not have been the best dad or said the right thing yesterday, but you know, God, God gives me another day to, you know, to, 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 try to do better. And, uh, so I don't beat myself up over the, the, uh, you know, when I'm not on my top of my game as a dad. Mm -hmm. And, uh, because I know that, you know, I am far from perfect, but what I, I try to be very transparent. And so, you know, what, what I, what I said the other day was, was, was wrong. I, I, you know, I'm sorry, will you forgive me? And those are very powerful words in any relationship. And, uh, and it's not, it's not easy to do. We got to enter into that battle and just say, you know what, when I mess up, I want to be very transparent and I want to be humble. I want to ask for forgiveness and we move on. Yeah. My devotional, we were, I was reading about uh, just Bethlehem, the city and how uh, sparse it was and how it was like the worst city around all the cities in the area. And like just the humble beginnings of where Jesus was born and everything. And with that uh, forgiveness part as a man, 
it's not something we like to admit all the time no. we're wrong. Yeah. And that pride gets in our way. And when you look to Jesus and like, hey, what do you got over there, bud? I was born in Bethlehem in a manger. <laughs> yeah. Animals everywhere. You know, nobody really wanted to give us a spot. And uh, so I always look, look for humility there. So like you've got a, a great point. You know, go, go to your kids quick and ask them for forgiveness and admit, you know, that you aren't at your best at that time and, you know, make it right with them. Yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. Well, I appreciate your time so much, Steve. Thanks for sharing your, your years of wisdom and advice. I always like to ask guys that have been there before me and uh, you with five daughters <laughs> have definitely been there before me in a lot of different scenarios. So uh, you might, uh, might get a phone call from me asking, <laughs> asking for a little guidance. Yeah. I don't know if I'd be much help, but yeah, feel free to reach out anytime. I think that, uh, uh, I, I, you know, I was blessed with my wife which is really talk about wisdom. She's really, uh, she, she did a lot of the heavy lifting. That's for sure. When it comes to raising these kids. Yeah. That's a huge thing to have that teamwork with your wife and be on the same page. And it's great to have one that is totally into raising the kids and does a good job. So that's fantastic. Like, uh, what's that in the Bible? Better than a, better than a pearl. Oh yeah. A good wife. A good. Yeah. 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 That's oh, it's a blessing. Uh, it's a blessing. So no, no question. It's a blessing. And, uh, you know, the relationship you develop with your kids is such a neat dynamic because, you know, it's very difficult when they're all little and, and you're under siege and it's, it's hard, but man, when they get older, it's just such a blessing to have all these kids around. And I got all these daughters and they'll, they call me and they FaceTime me and I, you know, I get these grandkids. I mean, I'm the luckiest man alive. I feel so blessed. And, and, uh, the, the 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 hard work when they were all young and and uh we were kind of going crazy for a lot of years it's, it's certainly paid off and i i feel bad i, I have a lot of friends and over the years it did they had one or two kids and they regret it almost all of them say i, I wish i would have had more kids it got hard and i stopped it got hard and, and i just didn't want to you know it got expensive or it got hard and and, yeah. and and they regret that decision because they see the 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 blessings of, of, of having multiple kids and, and, uh, and, and they wish they would have had more. And again, I think that I see a lot of young kids now that don't want to have, they want to have one or two kids. And that's cool. If that's what, if that's, that's nothing wrong with that at all. But, uh, I, uh, uh I think that they, they need to, um, my advice to them is, you know, it's not always going to be easy. It's not always going to be fun. It's, it's going to be expensive and all, but it's, you'll, you, you know, you, you're going to be glad you did it. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I selfishly wish that my, my daughter, I hope they have a lot of kids cause it's, there's nothing, there's nothing, uh, there's nothing like it. Grandpa Steve. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so well, that's fantastic. Well, I, I, again, appreciate your time so, so much and appreciate everything that we've been able to talk about and share with the guys and uh, look forward to catching up again. And then we're in the same Bible study. So like, yeah. really cool yeah. too. Yeah. Thanks for having me. I enjoyed it. Thank Absolutely. You. Well, thank you so much, Steve. Have a great day. Okay. Bye-bye.